It is the late evening of the 4th of October 1992. And emergency workers are flooding the Belmere district in Amsterdam, the Netherlands. An apartment building for the casual bystander looks like it has just collapsed. However, just a short while earlier, a Boeing 747 cargo plane had plummeted out of the sky, in doing so, cutting the residential building in half. Today, of course, we're looking at El Al Flight 1862. My name is John, and welcome to Plainly Difficult. Today's subject popped up on my radar since I've been on a bit of a building collapse binge and an image of a 1960s concrete building essentially being sliced in half has been rather hard for me to forget. Thrown into that, a Boeing aircraft was involved and the failure cause made this video almost an inevitability on my channel. I do recommend watching Chloe from Disaster Breakdown's video on the subject as well. So, Let's get into the video. This is a Boeing 747-200F. It's, in its most simplest description, a freighter variant of one of the world's most iconic airliners. The 747-200 was an improved range model from the original 747-100 with improved Pratt & Whitney JT9D7 engines. The freighter version had a hinged nose cargo door and could carry reportedly loads up to 100 tonnes. Construction of the 747-200 began in the early 1970s and the extended upper deck and increased range pleased many of Boeing's customers, one of which was El Al Airlines. El Al is Israel's flag carrier airline. It operates a mixed fleet of predominantly Boeing aircraft for both cargo and passenger operations. The company began its cargo operations just a few years after its original formation in the late 1940s. They took delivery of their first 747 in 1971, adding many more to their roster. One such was a 747F, constructed and delivered in 1979, with the registration for X-Ray Alpha X-Ray Golf. Which leads me rather quickly on to the disaster. Right, it's time for this week's sponsor, Private Internet Access. PIA, a virtual private network, is an application that hides your IP address and safeguards your internet connection through an encrypted tunnel. This way, it shields your digital life from the eyes of those who are looking to exploit and take your private information. Using the internet without PIA is like having a TV remote without any batteries. You're not really going to get very far. I use public Wi-Fi a lot as I'm out and about, and having a VPN is essential as it protects your information from anyone on the same Wi-Fi network with bad intentions, as they could have the ability to steal your personal data with ease, including sensitive information such as passwords, keystrokes, strokes and even your personal photographs, although no one would actually want any of my photographs. PIA also has the ability for you to change your IP address to any one of their 91 different countries, which is good when you want to buy things from another country and get local prices. It's also good if you use streaming services which have region locked content, and not only can you change your IP address to a different country, you can even pretend to be in any of all 50 US states allowing you to gain access to websites and services that are only available locally. PIA works on all major platforms, and now you can use one private internet access subscription to protect an unlimited number of devices at the same time. So, to check out PIA, go to www.piavpn.com slash plainly difficult to get 83% off private internet access with four months for free. And now, without any further ado, let's get on to this week's disaster. Disaster. It is the 4th of October 1992, and 4 X-Ray Alpha X-Ray Golf is landing in Amsterdam Schiphol Airport on a stopover on a flight from JFK Kennedy Airport to Ben Gurion International. Whilst at Amsterdam, the flight's crew is planned to be changed over. The fresh crew for the final leg of the flight are Captain Yitzhak Fuk, First Officer Arnon Ohad, and Flight Engineer Gedalia Sofa. Additionally on board, 1862 this evening, is an employee of El Al called Anat Solomon. 
The crew are very experienced with a combined 25,000 flight hours in the 747. The flight hours are mainly split between Sofa and Fuchs, with Ohad being the youngest of the three, having just 651 hours on the 747. Still though, he did have 10 years service with the airline. Fuchs was even rated as an instructor for the 747, so needless to say, the three men at the controls were very well experienced for the flight. Flight 1862 is scheduled to depart at 16.30, however due to the usual congestion of a busy airport, the actual slot given was 50 minutes later. By the time 1862 had requested pushback, at 17.05, the aircraft had just over 74,000 litres of jet fuel aboard, as well as a full cargo load. Taxiing began at 17.14. At the controls for the takeoff was the co pilot, and at 17.21, roll off began along runway 01 Lima. Initial takeoff and climb seemed pretty normal, reaching over 6,000 feet. At roughly 1727 and at 6,500 feet, the co-pilot transmitted a rather worrying Mayday radio call. Immediately, the crew began to dump fuel and made a turn towards the right. The Mayday call was acknowledged by ATC and the crew confirmed they wanted to return back to the airport. The heading was given and the pilots reported a fire on engines 3 and a loss of power on engine 4. What they didn't know was that both engines had actually fallen off of the aircraft. The crew requested runway 27 for their return. This is the longest at the airport. Due to the distance that the plane was, which was 7 miles out, and its altitude of 5,000 feet, a simple straight-in approach was rather unfeasible. Reportedly, Flight 1862 would require at least 12 miles for a correct approach. ATC requested the flight make a turn to the right and reach a lower altitude of 2,000 feet. However, the descent was too gradual and the speed was too high. The crew began reporting control issues. Sections of the plane's right wing flaps were unusable and the airflow over the now unengined wing severely affected its performance. The lift generated on the intact left wing and the added power on the left side engines to counteract the high sink rate began to overpower the aircraft as it slowed down. Quickly, the aircraft was becoming completely uncontrollable. At 17.35 and 25 seconds, the first officer radioed to ATC. Just 20 seconds later, the plane nosedived into an 11 story apartment block, slap bang into the centre. The building was two connected structures set at an angle from one another. The estate the plane crashed into was roughly 8 miles from Amsterdam Schiphol. The 747 was completely destroyed in the crash, and the resulting fire killed all aboard. However, the tragedy didn't end there. 43 more would die from within the building. So the crash occurred in an Amsterdam suburb. But rather quickly, emergency services arrived on the scene and began assisting the injured. The crash would mean the apartment block would have to be torn down, and work to decontaminate the ground from jet fuel and combustion products would take a while to be completed. The crash was and still is the most deadly aviation disaster in Netherlands history. Understandably, the crash of El Al 1862 would have to be investigated. Being Israel's flag carrier, some thought the down plane could have been linked to a terror plot, but it would unfold, but a simple design oversight would be the culprit. The Investigation In charge of the investigation would be the Netherlands Aviation Safety Board. They were informed on the, of the accident on the same day as the crash. On the recommendation of the board, the Ministry of Transport, Public Works and Water Management nominated a preliminary investigator, Mr. H.N. Wallerswinkel. Investigators scoured the crash site, but something was missing. Well, two things. The right wing's engines. They would later be recovered out in the waters around Narden Harbour. The debris that was found on land was spread over an area of 400 metres wide by 600 metres long. The flight data recorder was found and although very damaged, the plane's final moments could be recovered. Although strangely, the cockpit voice recorder was never found. 
What investigators discovered when looking at the remains of the right side wing, the damage showed as if engines 3 and 4 had detached and struck the wing. A sequence of events was planned out, where the engine 3 detached and then struck engine number 4. The theory is backed up by witness marks on both the wings and both engines. But how did engine 3 just fall off and hit the other engine? Well, we need to talk about how the engines were attached to the 747. You see, each engine was attached to the aircraft via five struts. They carry engine vertical, side torsional and thrust loads to the wing. These were, as noted on the FAA website, an upper link that connects the strut front spar to the underwing front spar fitting, a diagonal brace that connects the strut lower spar fitting to the underwing lower spar fitting, two mid spar fittings that connect the strut mid spar to the underwing mid spar fittings, and a single side link that connects one of the strut mid spar fittings to the underwing side brace fitting. All very good. And on top of that, these connections have a safety trick up their sleeve. You see, if you overload the wing by hitting the ground or a bizarre engine failure or extreme out of design spec flying, then you don't want the big heavy engines ripping off your wing unexpectedly. So what is that trick then? Well, it is a thing called a fuse pin. It's designed to be structurally weaker than the point it's used to attach to and the intentionally weaker fuse pin fails first if the wing is subjected to high loads, thus in theory protecting the wing structure and the fuel tank within. It's made weaker by being hollow, and as a whole the 747 was designed to meet 14 CFR Part 25571 Amendment 0. I'm quoting the FAA again here. The rule requires that the failure of a single principal structural element would not result in a catastrophic failure or affect the flight characteristics of the plane. The arrangement for the engine mounting on the 747 was almost identical in design to the earlier 707, where the concept of safe separation had been formed at the company. The theory was backed up by a number of engine dropping off events that didn't end in catastrophe although the five dead from BOAC 712 might disagree. But making a fuse pin isn't as straightforward as you might think. It's not just a case of making it weaker than the mounts, because it has to be only just weaker but still strong, as well dropping off an engine mid-flight on some poor sod's head might only slightly damage Boeing's safety reputation. That queue for payouts from victims isn't getting any shorter now, is it? The fuse pins originally used on the 747 were known as bottle bore pins. The inner bore of the fuse pin had a cross section that resembled the shape of a bottle, hence the name. The shape allowed the pin to vary the strength across the length of the shaft. The surfaces during manufacturing were machined. This had an undesired effect, however, and that was fatigue cracks. Fatigue cracks were found on multiple 747s in the 1970s, requiring Boeing to release a recommendation to inspect all fuse pins every 2,500 flight hours. This was in 1979, right when LL 1862 was being constructed. Anyway, a couple of years later, this recommendation and the airworthiness directive that went along with it were updated, advising replacement of all fuse pins for a new design type, or to inspect the original pins almost indefinitely. LL 1862's pins were not replaced, and inspections continued at the recommended 2,500 hours or 400 flight cycles. It was found that the flight was checked as per the recommendation and the plane's last inspection was 258 flight cycles earlier, which was well within Boeing's guidelines. During the investigation, not all of the fuse pins were recovered, hinting that some of them had shattered, and this gave a hint at a failure sequence. The initial failure occurred at the inboard mid-spar fuse pin, this overloaded the outboard mid-spar fuse pin and the side brace. These two subsequently failed, overloading the remaining connections, the upper link and diagonal brace, which were then overloaded and broke, freeing engine 3 from the wing, after which it collided with engine 4, and from there, LL 1862's fate was sealed. It was found that some of the fuse pins had fatigue cracks that had formed prior to the crash and this meant that the pins prematurely failed. As stated in the official Netherlands Aviation Board 
Inquiry report, which was released in 1994. The design and certification of the B747 pylon was found to be inadequate to provide the level required of safety. Furthermore, the system to ensure structural integrity by inspection failed. This ultimately caused, probably initiated by fatigue in the inboard mid-spar fuse pin, the number 3 pylon and engine to separate from the wing in such a way that the number 4 pylon and engine were torn off. Part of the leading edge of the wing was damaged and the use of several systems was lost or limited. This subsequently left the flight crew with very little control of the airplane. Because of the marginal controllability, a safe landing became highly improbable, if not virtually impossible. And this is where we would normally end a plainly difficult video. But it being a Boeing, it wasn't just an issue located solely to LL1862. You see, just 10 months before the crash, an almost identical accident happened. This was in Taiwan, and again, the number 3 engine had detached and crashed into the number 4. The disaster was put down to improper maintenance, but China Airline Flight 358 has a striking similarity to LL1862. Another two non-fatal engine strut events quickly followed with Evergreen Airlines in Anchorage, Alaska on the 31st of March 1993 and another incident with Northwest Airlines in Tokyo, Japan on the 1st of March 1994. As such, in the wake of the 1990s disasters, the 747's wing pylon was redesigned to a new damage tolerance design philosophy. The 747 would see its last plane being built in 2023. Interestingly, over its lifetime so far, 64 Boeing 747s, or 4.1% of the total fleet number, have been totaled in accidents, with a total of 3,746 deaths accredited to these events. So that's my video on LL 1862. If you have any more disasters involving planes crashing into buildings or anything like that, then let me know in the comments below. So, it is scale time. It's going to be a four today, and this is what I've got for my bingo card. Do you agree? This is a plain difficult production. All videos on the channel, Creative Commons, Attribution, attribution Share Alike Licensed. Plain difficult videos produced by me, John, in a currently wet and very miserable corner of southern London, UK. I have an Instagram and YouTube, a second YouTube channel, so check them out for all sorts of other bits and pieces I get up to. And I'd like to have a very warm thank you to my YouTube members and Patreons for your financial support, as well as the rest of you for tuning in every Saturday at 2pm GMT for your weekly dose of disaster and dodgy cartoons. And all that's left to say is thank you for watching, and of course, Mr Music, can you play us out please? <laughs>